a boring, uneventful, uninteresting SEC tournament, right? But we'll find something to talk about. Gabriella Lewis was there. I guess a couple of things happened that we're going to get into. Lockdown women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Of course, I kid very much a lot to get into. It is not a nothing to see here kind of SEC tournament. And good morning to you. I am Howard McDonald, and welcome to Locked on Women's Basketball. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. Over 180,000 of you showed up in February. It was a record. And February, I looked into this, is actually the shortest month, even in a leap year. So, Thank you the way we show up for you six days a week. It is not just me. It is the incredible team across the country and the world at the next, the next You saw it this weekend. We had correspondents all over the championship weekend across conference tournaments. And of course we had the great Gabriella Lewis at the SEC tournament. It was, I mean, I laugh about it because how many storylines were we getting into where it was just, all right, you're at this game, but these things are happening. And then, oh, now there's an additional storyline coming out of the game. Oh, here's a 20-minute delay while we figure out an altercation as part of the game. Undefeated teams, three-point shots from people who are not three-point shooters. Was that the best SEC tournament you ever saw? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, you know, the SEC knows how to put on good basketball always, but uh, boy, was this weekend exciting. Um, and, and like you said, I think there are a lot of times where the last two minutes of a game, you thought you knew it was going to happen and um, it completely changed. The most dramatic of that being a, a brawl, basically, uh, in the championship game. Um, that was, you know, something to write home about. I will say, and, and we'll get into the brawl and we'll talk about all of it. But it felt to me at some level like, oh, now we're going to be talking about just a brawl coming out of a tournament where any number of teams, and we talked about this off air, you know, we didn't talk South Carolina, LSU as teams. But up and down that conference, there are interesting players and teams that we're going to see play deep into March and, quite frankly, I think uh, have an opportunity to come be in Cleveland in April as well. So before we talk about the brawl and that aspect of it, I want to talk about South Carolina's journey. And I wrote about this mm -hmm. over nine last Wednesday, but just the fact that Dawn Staley, who was my pick for coach of the year in my USBWA vote, Dawn Staley loses four players to the WNBA, four players to the WNBA, including a generational center in Aaliyah Boston including a first-round pick in Zaya Cook. This team is better by every metric you can come up with, either even or better than that team that went undefeated through the conference tournament into the Final Four. And the reason they lost to Iowa was they were a 31% shooting team from three last year. They entered the SEC tournament shooting 40% from three. They entered the SEC tournament shooting at Caitlin Clark's level from three. Tahina Pow Pow's making almost half her threes. Yeah, Two leading things. the country. Leading the country. Two things. Number one, is South Carolina unbeatable in the NCAA tournament? And number two, is South Carolina better this year than last year? So I think no team is unbeatable, um, which is the boring answer. Um, and I actually particularly don't think the South Carolina team is beatable. Um, I, I think they are extremely good and an argument can be made that they're better than last year. But last year, I think the team felt like truly untouchable. You know, they had, they had basically won that, that fresh, that uh, senior class had won 
lost one game at home their entire career. And I think they really didn't even know how it felt to lose. Um, and so this year's team, I think, is extremely good, mm. but it's fresh in their mind, the loss in, in March Madness last year. Um, and they also have had some moments where it's been close games, right? Like it was a 10-point game with Texas A&M. Texas A&M is, is quite good. Uh, it was a less than, you know, it was like basically like a five-point game, most of their game against Ole Miss, and Ole Miss is very good. Um, and even LSU, you know, I think to me it felt like they were going to win that LSU game almost the whole time because they were just – oh, I'm sorry. I meant the Tennessee game that did not play Ole Miss. I'm thinking of last year. Uh, the Tennessee game, they, they quite literally almost lost, except Camila Cardoso hits a three, um, the first of her career. I think anyone who's been on Twitter probably has seen that clip. So um, they're – They've had they've gotten so many more close calls and Don Staley and post game presser after the LSU game said that she said by the law of, you know, dynamics like you can't you can't keep having these close games and win every single one. Um, and, and if anyone can do it, it's probably South Carolina. But I think to me, it's dramatic, the difference between the spreads they were beating people in last year and this year. And again, I think they're extremely good. I think they're the best in the nation, but I do don't, I don't think they're as good as they were last year. And I think many would disagree with me on that. Camilla Cardozo. She's missed four games this year. She's going to miss <clears throat> that round one game. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're not so reliant on her that that's going to be a problem against the 16 seed, right? No, absolutely. I mean, particularly against 16 seed, I think they'll be fine. You know, she got in some foul trouble during that LSU game uh, and they were bringing Ashlyn Watkins in and Sanaya Fagan had a great game as well. So uh, they've got, you know, no one as big as six, seven, but they have some other folks that they can rotate in. Ashlyn Watkins was, you know, kind of the runner up for SEC six women of the year. So she's, she's nothing to shy away from. The thing I keep going back and forth on with Cardozo is what is she at the next level? And obviously, six seven, you are big, big. You have an opportunity yeah. to be in the league, playing at the same size as a Tierra McCowan, who is a yeah. traditional back to the basket five, who is capable and has had actually a very good season. Now that she has a coach who knows how to use her the way Vic did in mm -hmm. Trammel. Um, exactly. That we have a whole other podcast just on Tierra <laughs> McCowan. But my my question for you is. Where does Cardozo fit in as a WNBA player, having seen her play all weekend? You know, I'm not a draft analyst, but um, I think she'll definitely, you know, if she declares this year, which she hasn't decided yet, I asked her three days ago and she said, I still haven't decided, which is what she's been telling me for a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think if she goes into the league this year, she could have a very prosperous, uh, you know, career. Uh, she could, have, or, you know, she could, I think she would stay at least a year. You know, you don't cut six, seven immediately. Right. Um, I think she has the ability to grow so much and she already has. And then what also is, I think, adding to her favor is she's played on that, on, for the Brazilian national team. Um, and so she's got the international experience. Mm. And, you know, when you go play, outside of the college level, I really think that adds to, to folks' games because um, it's just so much more. So, um, you know, I think it's – I'm definitely not counting out that she'll take another year at South Carolina. They're probably going to be great next year. You know, Tahina Pow Pow is coming back next year. So um, uh, who knows? But I definitely think she's got the ability to really uh, to thrive in the W. It is crazy, though. If, if you bring her back, Sakima Walker is the only other senior on that yeah. team. And they're bringing in three top 100 players. The only yeah. uh, person who had a better recruiting class coming in is Lindsey Gottlieb over at USC, who has yes. somehow six top 100 players coming in to play with Juju <laughs> Watkins. That's going to be yeah. ridiculous. And so I cannot wait to see that USC of the Big Ten, which is going to take some getting used oh, to. Bizarre. Um, it, it is very bizarre. South Carolina – Blows a 23-point lead to Tennessee, yes. as you wrote yes. about, over at the next. And then they come up with the big win. Does that help them in March to know that? Or does it help everyone who plays South Carolina to know, wow, they could blow a 23-point lead? I think it does both. Um, you know, I think, like I said, it makes them feel um, like there's an ability to lose. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that has to instill the fear of God in them a little bit of we really didn't want to lose. And Raven Johnson, after the game, you know, said to press, she was like, I wanted to cry on that court. All I could think about was like, 
losing last year. And I think that was just so traumatic for them. And she was like, I think everyone was having these moments of flashbacks to last year and all they wanted was not to have it. And that just, but then she also, the caveat to that was if coach Daly felt like we could win, I felt like we could win. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's no breaking story that South Carolina players have an unbelievable amount of trust in coach Daly, but you know, that's really special to have a coach where you're like, as long as she's in it, we're in it. And so um, I, I think that it's it's hopefully going to kind of give them a new perspective. But I also think, and, and like you said, this the fight should not eclipse the incredible basketball we saw in Greenville this weekend. Yeah. But I think the that fight and a lot of players being ejected is also probably going to kind of make them realize how important this is and how you know you can you can leave a game for um, a situation like that. And you know, Coach Daly was not happy with them, so. Mm. I think there's going to be probably some new perspective this week. We'll talk more about Dawn. I want to get into LSU as well. We will talk about the fight, but again, there's just there's so much better, so much better basketball. To get yes. to that's the thing. So so we'll, we'll touch on it, but man, uh, there's there's a lot more to get to. Right, followed in segment two. So a lot more to come. Tennessee. We got to talk Lauren Park Lane. So we will get to all of that. But first. <clears throat> Lockdown Women's Basketball is brought to you by BetterHelp. And so, look, sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest. There are big things, small things, things that really kind of start to get to you. You have to let that out. And maybe the best way to do it is to somebody who is unbiased on your life. Okay. The way you can do that is through BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy, it's an opportunity to online on a flexible timetable that works with your schedule to get a perspective on things you need to figure out. Go to betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA and you get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp com slash locked on NBA. Go to BetterHelp, talk it through, figure it out. It really makes a difference. There are other ways, of course, of dealing uh, with your frustrations. We saw them near the end of that LSU ten of that LSU South Carolina game of two minutes and eight seconds to go. I, again, the you know the fight is the fight. I I felt very strongly that Dawn Staley handled that in precisely the way you'd want someone to handle it. Don Staley yeah. quickly took responsibility, apologized to the basketball community, handled it internally in-house. How are you going to learn from it? Emotions get the better of players, like she said. And these are young players. Yeah. I, I, I And they're protectors is what she talked about also. You know, last year's team, she said, this never would have happened because Aaliyah Boston would have gotten in there and been the referee. But mm -hmm. this year's team, they talk a little more in practice. They want to protect each other. They jump in when each other need each other. Right. Sorry. I, no, I'm glad you did because it just, it goes back to, I just think these are unreasonable expectations for human beings that you put them in the pressure cooker of a game like that. And these are 18, 19, 20, 21 year old women trying to figure out the world in real time with the glare of the national spotlight on them in a, an extremely physical game that quite frankly, the refs didn't have a handle on. So like no. you put all that together and anyone who's passing judgment, moral judgment there, I think needs to look in the mirror, but that's a digression. You look at South Carolina, you look at LSU. We've talked about the Gamecocks. LSU, that's a hell of a team. That yeah. is a team, you, you know, it, it didn't get a lot of press last year, but they won the national title, you know. I mean, so you look at that. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Right. Yeah. Crazy, right? Who remembers? Yeah. I mean, the defending champs here, I mean, that was just, oh, my God, a heavyweight title for the ages. And so having seen them play all weekend, where is, what is the state of LSU right now? Yeah. 
it, it's so interesting. And I keep thinking back to last year for a lot of these teams and LSU and South Carolina are good examples of last year when South Carolina, you know, they lost in the semis to, to Tennessee and then in the SEC tournament. And I think it was kind of like very disappointing for them, but that was what the world expected in so many ways. No one thought they were going to go win a national championship, including Kim Mulkey. Um, and so, but now they have so much expectation that, Oh, they have to go far, you know, they, they lose a couple games in the first five games and people are saying, oh, you know, they're a losing team. So I, I think that they are a better skilled team this year, right? You bring on Anissa Morrow, Flaugia Johnson has only gotten better. Michaela Williams is really good. Haley Van Lith, you know, has brought a solid presence. Um, so I think they are better and they'll tell you that. Um, however, they're depleted, you know, they, they've never been a, like a, a really deep team, but they're very thin this year. Michaela Williams was injured last year. Poa had a really tragic um, head injury uh, during the semis that, you know, we're, we're hoping she'll be back, but she's in concussion protocol now. Um, as well as also, you know, Angel's got a bit of a, an ankle situation, some other folks out for the season. And so what really struck me about LSU is during their game, um, uh, on Friday is they had zero bench points. Zero bench points is really concerning. Um, you know, they again have so many good players, but if you have nothing coming off the bench, that's really challenging. And then they had, I think four bench points in another game. So um, my fear for them uh, is that, you know, someone gets injured again, God forbid, and you're really in a tricky situation, but we know that they know how to turn it on. Coach Wolke knows how to, uh, coach in these situations. Angel Reese, I think, is looking particularly good. And what I saw from the SEC tournament is Angel Reese, she knows how to take over a game in a way that I don't think she knew how to take over last year. And yeah. she's just a really special player at the end of the day. She's going to need to do it. A difference from this year and last year is Alexis Morris not yeah. on this team. And yeah. it's easy to forget how much Alexis Morris is why that team won the national title yes. game last year so yes. that's number one number two and and this is a thing i keep going back to how effectively Haley van lith limits the mistakes and hits her three yeah if you go down the totally. stretch of the south carolina game they had gotten within three and then there's that difficult look that hbl misses that allows south carolina to get out and transition it was sort of a secondary break but ultimately put them up five it got lost in the things that immediately followed. But that to me was yeah. where South Carolina was able to take control of the game. And Bree Hall, you know, I think she had nine for the game, but four big points in that time. Yeah. She knew oh how to shoot yeah. the right points in that right moment. If you've got somebody who was able to lock down Angel in a given moment like that, it's going to have to come from Anissa Morrow. It's going to have to come from HBL. Yes. And there aren't a lot of other options once you get past those starting five, like you said. Listen. There's an alt history where Jenna Johnson makes her free throws in the round yeah. of 15. And LSU is a team that was super talented that reached expectations last year, losing the Sweet 16 to Utah. And now we're wondering, can they take that next step and make it to the final four? It's probably unfair to say, gee, national title or bust, especially, yes. you know, leave aside the non SEC teams. We're living in a world where South Carolina looks this good. So I'm fascinated to see yeah. it. I am also fascinated when you talk about expectations, and I feel like you and I have had this meta discussion for years now. But Tennessee, mm. Tennessee, what what yeah. do you do with them? What do you do with them? You know, it's like the flip side of what we just talked about with South Carolina. You just almost went out and beat South Carolina coming back from 23 down. Everyone is so locked in on oh kelly harper isn't doing enough we're somehow measuring her by pat summit which is not fair for how many yeah. reasons what, uh, where's the yeah. issue? how do you how do you what here's the deal what's the over under on reasonable expectations for tennessee in this ncaa tournament i think they can go far i mean i i feel like i'm living in groundhog's day i'm sitting there <laughs> covering this game against south carolina and a beat reporter on the Tennessee beat turns to me and goes, they're going to do it again. 
they're good. They made history coming back from a 17 point deficit last year in the SEC tournament. And now they're going to do it with 23 points. And they thought they were going to as well as they were celebrating in, in the final three seconds. But we were just like, are you kidding me? Tennessee has had the most tumultuous season, even more tumultuous than last year. Anyone in their locker room will tell you that right. they've built this toughness, as Kelly Harper told us. And then they go on to over exceed expectations in the SEC tournament, which, you know, they, they did. They weren't even a top four team via standings this season in the SEC. Um, and now they're going on to at a really good place to go into the NCAA tournament. I think they'll they'll do pretty well. I think they can make it to the Sweet 16. Um Again, like you talked about, I, I actually went back and listened to that conversation we had about Tennessee last year, mm. and it, it's so they'll always live in the shadow of Pat Summit, and they're not as good as Pat, a lot of Pat Summit teams. But I think they, because of this legacy program and because of Kelly Harper, they really know how to hit their stride at the correct time, and they really know how to hit their stride in March. Um, I think that they've got absolute legs. Rakia Jackson, this tournament, if it proved maybe one thing to me, it's that Rakia Jackson is going to be a, a top WNBA recruit and is so yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um, that game against South Carolina, she just absolutely, you know, she had three points in the first half and I think 19 in the second. She just went absolutely off. Um, and like I said, knows how to take over games at the right time. So if she's clicking and she's staying out of foul trouble, she, I think Tennessee has has a real opportunity. You've got, I mean, that combo between Rakia Jackson and Jewel Spear, who you wrote about, yeah. um, who was just, I mean, that was just such a massive pickup. And I remember I talked to Kelly Harper about this at the start of the year, that yeah. a difference maker that that's you're built to win in March. But it's just it's funny you say that. Right. Like they make the NCAA tournament. They reach the Sweet 16. It shouldn't be treated like a disappointment. It shouldn't totally. be treated like a disappointment. And totally. No, I don't know. It, 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 it is an unfair Tennessee's a no win situation. Sure. And even if they win a national title, it'll but. But did they win it by enough? I feel like will be the standard yeah. at that point, which is which is ridiculous. All right, much more to get to. Want to talk about additional teams in the SEC? Have to talk about Lauren Park Lane. I'm contractually obligated any <clears throat> show I ever do to talk about her. So we're going to get right back to that in segment three. But first, want to talk to you guys about the lineup over at Nissan. And so look, if all Nissan sold were the 2024 Nissan Rogue, Dianu, right? I mean, class exclusive, Google built-ins, always updating your assistant to call on for almost anything. The road has the touchscreen infotainment system. It's a perfect mid-sized crossover, but that's just one. They've got the Nissan Pathfinder. All right, let's say you have a lot of friends or a big family. Well, they seat up to eight, 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing. So when you're going on that big adventure, let's say you're taking everyone to the final four in Cleveland, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Okay, let's say you really want to take them in extra luxury. Go with the 2024 Nissan Armada, okay? Full-size SUV, a rugged four by four, Seats up to eight in first-class luxury in style. Tow bigger, explore further in the 2024 Armada. You can take any of them for a test drive. Go to your local Nissan dealership. Shop them online at NissanUSA.com. Go find your next big adventure with Nissan. And somebody who would fit in any of these cars and then some is Lauren Park Lane, Five foot three, but a game that exceeds all of that. I had the privilege of covering her in the best state, New Jersey, where she played for Seton Hall. And now she made the decision. Okay, I acknowledge Starkville has its charms, too. I love little Dewey's. She just went out there for Mississippi State and played her heart out again. You wrote a great feature on her. I mean, I know I'm biased in favor of Lauren Park Lane content, but just like Take me through the Lauren Park Lane experience and for listeners who may not know what makes her special. Yeah, Lauren is, is a very special player. You know, 
you you equated to it, but she's five three, which is you know not not the average height, especially in the SEC. Um, and she comes to Mississippi State, which was a huge pickup for them out of the portal. Um, and you know I, I won't say she had a season where she went off, but that's not really what her game was at, at in Starkville. You know she she averaged around thirty at Seton Hall, and you know closer to ten or so. Um, at Mississippi State and I spoke with her about this and she basically was like yeah it was mentally really tough to go from that to to what I was at uh here but in the same breath she's about to break the single season assist record at Mississippi State and so I think she and the piece that I wrote really talked about how she found herself she realized you know what I can't be as prolific a scorer here because I'm next to you know, a, a lot of other really talented scorers. However, I'm still going to make this impact. And so I, I really appreciate her candor of it was a mentally challenging year, especially, you know, she made some comments from Gina Ariama um, that kind of she didn't felt, feel really impacted her too much, but there was a lot of talk around her. Um, but regardless, she really comes at it with um, a level of like maturity and um, intensity for the game that um, mm-hmm. is a delight to watch. When you look at the teams that are right on the bubble, Mm. you know, everyone's projecting right now. So here we are on the morning of March 12th on Tuesday. Charlie Cream right now has the last four in. See if these teams sound familiar to you. Texas A&M, Vanderbilt, Arizona, and Mississippi State are the last four in right now. Columbia is one of the first four out. Yes. It's almost like the SEC tournament continues this weekend in New York with our own Jen Hatfield covering the Ivy League tournament. I would be so sad as a basketball observer for the nation not to get a chance to see Lauren Park Lane in Mississippi State. Having seen those teams, I mean, and again, you know, we didn't even talk about Vanderbilt, but Vanderbilt and what Shea Ralph has done, so significant, such, yeah. such growth in that program. They deserve an award, too. And Texas A&M, we talked off air. You think they could win a couple of games in the tournament, right? Well, let me say one just anecdote. I'm talking to Janiah Barker at Texas A&M post-game after they lost to South Carolina. And I've got this Charlie Cream, you know, bracketology up. Charlie was at the SEC tournament, so maybe that's why there's so many SEC teams in there. And I say to her, I go, you're projected to play Vandy in the play-in right now of March Madness. She goes, Vandy, what are you talking about? I go, yeah, that's that's what they're saying. She goes, Vandy lost. They lost yesterday to Florida. And she's kind of looking around. I'm like, what are you, what are you looking at, John? She's like, I'm looking at the bracket. They lost, didn't they? And the SIP turns to her and goes, well, we lost too, Janaya. She goes, yeah, but to South Carolina. It's totally oh. different. <laughs> so um, – that being said, she was excited about playing a potential SEC team. But, yeah, we've got three teams here on the bubble. Yeah. Um, and Lauren Park Lane, Janiah Barker, Jordan Cambridge at Vandy. I think those are all hoops that the world should see. Yeah. I mean, there's there's just so much talent in this game right now. So much talent in the SEC. Before I let you go, a team that won't play in the NCAA tournament this year that you were most impressed by, you think is going to be – the next breakout, the next Vanderbilt. Who is that going to be of the teams you saw this weekend? Florida. I mean, I think it's it's fresh on the mind how good Florida is. Um, Aliyah Mathuru, who just had a 35-point game the other day, you know, really impressive stuff. And I think Kelly Ray Finley is a really special coach. They've been on this this edge of being good. Um, and I think they've, they've underperformed a little in the last two years. They're just pretty inconsistent right now. But I think if they continue to get some pieces and um, – Missy Heidrick and I always have this conversation of they have such the opportunity to be so good because Florida is full of incredible hoopers. And so yeah. if they can just make a couple kids stay home, they'll be really good. So I have, I have high hopes for Florida. I think that they are good on both sides. And, you know, Ryan Howard was one of their assistant coaches this year who I wrote a piece about in the fall. And I think she really stepped into that role well. So yeah, I've got high hopes for Florida. Man, Ryan Howard and her basketball IQ manifesting yeah. on both college and the pros. You know, it is a lucky time in the world of women's basketball to have Ryan Howard Definitely. in all those roles. Gabriella Lewis, we are lucky to have you writing at the next. We are delighted to have you here. It is always great to chat with you. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for all you did at the SEC tournament to our listeners at home. Thank you for making us your first listen. Every day, we'll be back tomorrow 
with the great Angie Holmes, who was at the Big Ten tournament. I'm going to ask her, were there any particularly eye-catching guards who uh, impressed and are perhaps uh, going to uh, make a leap to the WNBA? Not sure, um, Not but sure. she'll have the answer if anybody comes up. And a uh, couple other players at the Big Ten tournament as well. So until tomorrow, I am Howard Magdal wishing all of you a wonderful Tuesday. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.